What's happening in the world right now, coming up on NTD News. First, our top stories. What would a Ron DeSantis presidential candidacy look like? With the Florida governor set to toss his hat into the ring of the 2024 election, we hear from analysts. Carrie Lake says she's launching a grassroots operation to get out the Republican vote in Arizona. Lake is vowing to throw a wrench into any plans of what she calls stealing elections. The FCC warning that the facial recognition you use for your phone can be hacked. The commission says AI is making it easier for criminals to clone biometric information. Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Our top news is on the 2024 presidential election. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is launching his campaign tonight. That will be in a Twitter Spaces interview with Elon Musk at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The Epic Times confirmed the plan with the DeSantis campaign press secretary. Twitter Spaces allows large groups of people to participate in a voice conversation. The feature doesn't currently support video. The platform will be used to pull questions in from the audience. DeSantis' wife posted a teaser video about the bid on Twitter last night. They call it faith because in the face of darkness, you can see that brighter future. A faith that our best days lay ahead of us. But is it worth the fight? Do I have the courage? Is it worth the sacrifice? America has been worth it every single time. DeSantis will be joining a crowded GOP field in an average of polls maintained by Real Clear Politics. Former President Trump held the lead today with 56 points. DeSantis trailed in a distant second with 19 points. And now NTD's Daniel Monahan has more on DeSantis's long-awaited announcement today. Who's coming with him and what do political analysts have to say? DeSantis contending for the Republican presidential nomination will put him on a collision course with former President Donald Trump. Brown University professor Wendy Schiller believes he can put that to his advantage. Well, he's going to make the argument that he is uh, as conservative as Donald Trump, uh, but that he has no baggage. Schiller says DeSantis will lean on his track record as a successful governor, a governor re-elected with a wide margin in a very competitive electoral state and that he has moved the conservative social agenda forward in Florida, and that he'll do the same thing nationwide. The Florida governor has tackled multiple hot-button cultural issues head-on in Florida. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. Presidential historian Tevi Troy says the current political climate makes that a must to win over the Republican electorate. The cultural issues, uh, the concerns about wokeism and critical race theory and corporate wokeism, uh, I think are issues that really inflate the base and uh, get the base excited. Troy says DeSantis has more than just legislative and executive experience. He's also served in the military, which is an increasingly rare trait among our presidents these days, and I think a welcome one. A Wall Street Journal poll released in April showed Trump winning around 48 percent of the vote in a 12 contestant primary. DeSantis came in second with 24 percent among likely Republican voters. If elected, DeSantis says he sees the way to a possible 7-2 conservative supermajority that would last a quarter century on the Supreme Court. This as multiple justices get on in age. Meanwhile, DeSantis got some welcome news in his nascent candidacy. GOP megadonor and Point Bridge Capital founder Hal Lambert told Fox News he is throwing his weight behind the Florida governor. Donald Trump can only serve one term. Uh, He'll effectively be a lame duck uh, almost on day one if he were to win. But Lambert doesn't believe that Trump can be victorious in the general election. And he sees Governor DeSantis as a vision forward rather than hashing things out from the past. I think Governor DeSantis has just done an amazing job as governor. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that candidacy. Uh, It's time to move on to the next generation. Lambert says there is a very stark contrast between DeSantis and President Joe Biden, adding that he plans to do everything he can to help DeSantis get the Republican nomination. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Arizona Republican Carrie Lake is vowing to paint Arizona red. She is launching a grassroots ballot chasing operation. The goal is to boost Republican turnout in future Arizona elections. Here's like yesterday in Phoenix. We've got to work in this rigged, corrupt system, and we can do it. 
We will not allow them to steal another election from we the people. We want our government back. And right now, we have people sitting in these offices at our government who are not duly elected. Lake says Arizona Republicans are going to roll up their sleeves and play by the same rules she says Democrats play by. The former news anchor says the new initiative will include volunteers ramping up door knocking and voter registration efforts. Lake's new operation comes on the heels of an Arizona judge's May 22nd decision to toss her lawsuit. She was challenging the results of the state's 2022 election for governor. Lake maintains she rightfully won that election. Mitt Romney has a new competitor for his seat in the Senate. A government official in Utah is tossing his hat into the race. Here's Riverton Mayor Trent Staggs. Right now, Washington is broken. And every time we compromise, it costs us trillions. We have more IRS agents than border agents. And while we're paying $4 a gallon for gas, they're sending our money unchecked to Ukraine. Now we're almost $32 trillion in debt. Enough is enough. Staggs is the first major Republican to launch a campaign for the Senate seat in the red state. Romney has filed paperwork for a run, but has not made a final choice on a 2024 re-election campaign. His chief of staff says he will make a final decision in the coming months. Romney has earned ire from some Republicans for some of his positions, including voting to convict then-President Donald Trump at the end of an impeachment trial. And still to come, the market for artificial intelligence in healthcare is expected to expand exponentially in the next 10 years. How could that impact everyday Americans? Former POWs from the Vietnam War get together this week at the Nixon Presidential Library in California. We'll take you there in just a moment here on NTD News Today. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast, cable, or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times. I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff. I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epic Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. The lasting beauty of realistic oil painting. Brilliant, expressive, and inspirational. The 6th NTD International Figure Painting Competition. Guided by pure authenticity, beauty, and goodness. Invites you to join us on a journey back to traditional art. The gold award is $10,000. For more details, please visit oilpainting.ntdtv.com. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. Prediabetes does. One in three adults has prediabetes. And you could be one of them. There are usually no signs for prediabetes. So it's important to understand your risk. With early diagnosis, prediabetes can be reversed. And you can change the outcome. Take the one minute prediabetes risk test today 
go to doihaveprediabetes.org. Welcome back. Most people nowadays unlock their phones using facial recognition, fingerprint scans, or something similar. The FTC is now warning users that this kind of data can be hacked and manipulated. Here's what the commission has to say. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission, or FTC, has issued a warning saying biometric information collected by businesses can be hacked and manipulated. Such information includes facial recognition, fingerprints, as well as voice and eye scans. The FTC says the threat is now being amplified following the rise of artificial intelligence. Accessing biometric data can give criminals access to sensitive information about an individual. For example, whether they attend specific political meetings, religious services, or gatherings, the type of healthcare they access, and more. The FTC also said in its warning last week that criminals may also use such data to get unauthorized access to devices, facilities, or data. These issues pose risks not only to individual consumers, but also to businesses and society. The warning comes amid the increased use of AI in biometric scams. In May, the McAfee group found that just three seconds of audio was enough to clone an individual's voice. This can be used for online voice scams. The warning points out that since 2012, some biometric information technologies, such as facial recognition technology, have made significant advances. The FTC said in the policy statement that it intends to scrutinize companies that collect, use, or market biometric data and technologies. In recent years, the FTC has brought action against Facebook and others on charges that these tech firms misrepresented the uses of facial recognition technology. Artificial intelligence could bring exciting advancements in the field of healthcare and medicine, but along with its potential, there are dangers that come with it. Here's more from NTD's Don Ma. The global market size of generative AI in healthcare could expand to as much as 40 times larger in the next 10 years, according to some estimates. Artificial intelligence in medicine is making strides in advancement every day. Here's AI researcher Alexander de Ritter. And one of the things that is exceptionally interesting about this is that you can upload uh, like your blood test results and you can upload other medical data and history of a patient. And these AI models are able to interpret that and cross-reference it with all the available medical literature and giving them access to the latest research and, and the best potential treatments and diagnosis. De Ritter says that AI is also actively being used to develop new medication to identify new proteins. He says one day there will be a cure for cancer. But with all the potentials, there are pitfalls to AI in medicine. Recently, the World Health Organization advised caution in the use of artificial intelligence in health. The concern here is, is really your patient data privacy. Let's just say you have a wart on your foot. And it's not exactly something you want to post on your Instagram, right? It's not something you want other people to know. Uh, now, if you go to, to an AI model and say, how do you treat a wart on my foot, <laughs> right? You're already sharing something very private with an AI model. There's also a danger that artificial intelligence may be used to create medical weapons. Technology can be used by nefarious actors with bad intentions, right? So... For example, it becomes uh, possible for uh, people to use AI to come up with uh, super, super bugs or super viruses. So then the question becomes like, how does government even regulate that when people can do it individually in their homes? It's the same uh, conversation around like, uh, are you going to ban 3D printers just because 3D printers can print gun parts? Despite the possible pitfalls, de Ritter says there's hope the benefits of AI will outweigh the risk. Former POWs from the Vietnam War are gathering this week to mark the 50th anniversary of their return home. Entity's Andrew Thomas has the latest on the event. Cheering supporters greeted POWs and veterans during a parade by the Nixon Presidential Library in California. One was 82-year-old Tom McNish. He was captured after he was shot down over North Vietnam on September 4th, 1966. My entire six and a half years in prison, I had absolutely zero doubt that my country would never forget me. 
that I would be brought home I, back to my country, whether I was alive or did not survive. For McNish, the gathering is a chance to bond with friends who went through similar experiences. What we're celebrating is our return from captivity and the amazing opportunity to get together with some of my closest friends. You'll never find, find a more tightly welded group of friends because we've been through the same hellfire together. Orson Swindle says the gathering is an opportunity to connect with his fellow POWs. When we get together, we don't dwell on bad things. We just talk about funny things and laugh at, and you know, it's that, you just can't dwell on the, the past and lament about what happened or what didn't happen. That's, that's water over the dam. And Swindle says that most people struggle to grasp what it meant to be a POW in Vietnam. We. Uh, we all suffered in many, many ways that most people don't know anything about, you know, family separations and deaths and just bad circumstances, but we overcame it all and talk about life-changing experiences. Vietnam veteran Mike McGrath was a POW for six years. We are just a bunch of friends and uh, we formed, a, we formed in, you know, the POW world, we formed a uh, fraternity. You know, we're all in this together, and it didn't matter what your rank was. We all lived together in our underwear. You know, <laughs> that's all you have is that you're in a room with another guy in his underwear. And... Despite his captivity, he says he doesn't harbor ill will toward his former adversaries. So I have no hard feelings against the Vietnamese at all. That's all in the past. And, we, and in, you know, in healthy life, you just press on. You don't harbor any grudge. You don't get even. You just... Uh, just press on on my The Nixon Presidential Library is marking the 50th anniversary of the return of the POWs with a new exhibition, Captured, Shot Down in Vietnam. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. After the break, China is banning foreign embassies from displaying messages of solidarity with Ukraine and other signs which it calls propaganda. Russia's prime minister said bilateral ties with China are at an unprecedented high as the two countries sealed new economic pacts. We'll have the details for you in just a minute. What does it mean to devote your life to the truth? Does it mean investigating communist subversion here in America? Does it mean exposing the deadly fentanyl crisis in the Midwest? Or spending late nights and covering deep government corruption? Because at a time when America's traditional values are under attack, it's the responsibility of righteous journalists to uphold truth and tradition. Good to have you back with us. The CCP's new ambassador to the U.S., Xia Feng, arrived in New York yesterday. Upon landing, he told reporters that his mission is to defend China's interests and to enhance bilateral relations. I am the uh, representative of China. So I have come here to safeguard China's interests. This is my sacred responsibility. I am also the uh, envoy of the Chinese people. So I've come here to uh, enhance China-U.S. exchanges and cooperation. She acknowledged the serious challenges facing the U.S.-China relationship. He listed sensitive issues like Taiwan. Xi's predecessor, Qing Gang, was promoted to foreign minister late last year. Xi himself most recently served as China's vice foreign minister. He has been known for his confrontational tone toward the U.S. In February, he criticized Washington for shooting down the Chinese spy balloon, saying this was acting obstinately. Beijing widening its control over speech. A recent announcement warned foreign embassies not to display signs it deems propaganda, like those showing messages in solidarity with Ukraine. Analysts call the directive political bullying. Let's take a closer look. In a May 10th notice, China's foreign ministry told foreign embassies not to display politicized propaganda on their buildings in order to avoid inciting disputes between countries. Diplomats in Beijing said the order targets solidarity with Ukraine 
After Russia waged war on the country last February, foreign missions of the European Union, Britain, Germany, and Poland flew Ukraine's flags on their outer walls. Later, a Ukrainian flag poster outside the Canadian embassy was defaced with an anti-NATO graffiti. China has called for peace in Ukraine but has refrained from condemning Russia. When the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Russian President Vladimir Putin in March, Xi Jinping made a high-profile visit to Russia, seeking a boost in their cooperation. The Chinese Communist Party has been advocating among its people that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is justified. That is to create public opinion for its armed reunification of Taiwan. Those signs that run counter to Beijing's advocacy would undermine its brainwashing efforts. The Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations shields diplomats from legal sanctions in the country of assignment, but Beijing's notice claims that embassies are obliged to comply with Chinese laws and regulations. Analysts warn that Beijing's control of speech has reached beyond its borders. If foreign embassies pull down the pro-Ukraine flags or signs, the CCP would achieve its goal of political bullying. The communist regime not only seeks to control other countries over international affairs, it even lays its hands on their consulates and tries to meddle in their internal affairs. At least one diplomat says their mission won't comply with Beijing's request. Let's talk about the risks associated with major pharmaceutical company Merck's China business. Do dealings involving the communist regime pose a risk to investors? What about the security of pharmaceutical supply chains given the history of geopolitical tensions involving the Chinese regime? I spoke with a shareholder to find out. Joining me now is Paul Chesser, Director of the Corporate Integrity Project at the National Legal and Policy Center. Paul, it's great to have you with us today. Thanks for having me. Now, pharmaceutical company Merck, their business in China has been growing rapidly in the past few years, and your organization has presented a communist China audit proposal to the company. Can you explain why? Sure. Well, you know, we're we're shareholders in a number of major corporations, Fortune 500 companies, and during this proxy season, you know, the spring is known for proxy season at major companies. Uh, we brought this proposal at, at nine different companies uh, where we're, we have concerns about the risks and vulnerabilities of these companies because of the extent of the business they do in China, whether it's supply chain or sales or both, um, you know, just their presence there. And Merck was one of those. And, and Merck is is very, we see as very vulnerable. You know, they, the companies... Uh, universally uh, say, oh, we don't need a report like this. They don't want to be embarrassed or shamed about having to do business in or with China. And whenever you're in China, you're you're susceptible to the, the, the dictatorship there and the, their whims, whether it's zero COVID policies or what have you. So with Merck, you know, they've got about $12.2 billion in research and development activity over there. They, uh, according to their China website, you know, translated to English, uh, they they did 48.7 billion in sales last year. It represents 9.7 percent of their sales revenue in uh, 2022. So we see that as significant, obviously. And uh, you know, when you go and look at these disclosures that these companies file, whether it's Merck or, or any of the other companies we we we've dealt with, uh, they you know they say, oh, we've got it filed in our annual reports at the SEC in our disclosures, and they're required to disclose risk, but they don't do it in any kind of detail. They just say, oh, we're we're there, you know, geopolitical uh, tensions or, or disruptions could, could cause a problem here. And that's pretty much the extent of their uh, their disclaimers or their their uh, Paul, their owning you, up to up to risk. Yeah, you've established that they are obviously not accepting this proposal, saying that they've already made these reports to the SEC. What further information are you seeking? Well, we we want them to disclose, you know, things like, you know, what would happen, you know, they they don't want to go into hypotheticals, and you can only go so much into hypotheticals, but you look at, uh, you know, Chairman Xi Jinping uh, and his saber rattling against Taiwan. Well, if you look at the context of almost all the U.S. multinational companies who exited Russia after Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, be out of principle, out of you know, uh, we can't we can't stand or uh, just, you know just sit, uh, bear with this, um, and you know yet China is a much bigger risk, a much bigger presence for near pretty much all of these companies. If they invaded Taiwan, that would be uh, multiple times bigger than what Russia did with Ukraine. So would they just exit 
China, uh, you know, that would that would be a, a pretty significant hit to their bottom line. Uh, you know, and then they, you know, many of these companies, including Merck, you know, they have rhetoric about, you know, during Black Lives Matter, they said, oh, how you know bad our country's history is and we have to, uh, you know, uh, hold the police accountable, so forth in our, in our history. Yet, you know, there's atrocities going on in China. The State Department has said, you know, it's a genocide. It, there's uh, organ harvesting, as is, is, uh, your organization has report going on in China of, of these political prisoners and religious minorities. So what about the human rights, uh, you know, adamance about human rights in China, yet you're, these companies, Merck and Walmart and McDonald's, are in business with the communist government. You're, you can't help but be in business with them and you're susceptible to whatever they tell you you must do or you can't do, you know, self-censorship, things like that as well. Yes, absolutely. These are very real risks. Paul Chesser at the National Legal and Policy Center, thank you so much for your time. Good to be with you. Now to the Indo-Pacific, where the U.S. and China are both vying for influence in the region. I wanted to learn more about U.S. efforts to build alliances there, so I spoke with an expert. Have a listen. Joining me now is Grant Newsham, retired Marine Colonel and Senior Fellow at the Center for Security Policy. Grant, it's great to have you with us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. I want to talk about the security pact that the U.S. has just signed with Papua New Guinea. How will alliances in the Indo-Pacific affect the balance of power there as Beijing shows itself to be increasingly belligerent in the region? Well, alliances are everything in the Pacific. Uh, America's had uh, the upper hand for decades, but China has slipped itself in over the last 30 years. has done very well uh, in influencing uh, certain countries. It has a presence in every country. So it's really important that the United States takes Uh, the region seriously. And this deal with New Guinea, with Papua New Guinea, uh, is evidence of that if they take full advantage of it. Papua New Guinea has a population of about 10 million. Can you give us an idea of the scope here of what this alliance is going to lead to? Well, it potentially leads to a substantial U.S. presence, not huge, but in terms of influence uh, in Papua New Guinea. And this is essential uh, because you do want Papua New Guinea to feel like they're not just real estate agents, but they're actually being treated like equals. And it is an opportunity for the U.S. to show that it really does have uh, the ability to focus on these strategically important islands, nations, and to ensure that the locals get more out of it than we do. You know, we get a military advantage, political advantage, but you want them to be able to uh, upgrade their own capabilities, their own security to benefit from the, the relationship. So really what happens from here on out is what matters. Uh, will this be a priority, I say, for Indo-PACOM? Uh, and if it is done right, it potentially sets uh, an example that might be replicated throughout the region. So this was a, a good a good development to see it, see it announced. But as, as is always the case, it's now what happens. Let's see. Are we currently headed to or in right now a Cold War with China, especially considering the recent security agreement between the Chinese regime and the Solomon Islands? Well, we've been in a Cold War with the Chinese for a long time. Uh, just read the Chinese press for a week and tell me what you think. Uh, it's pretty clear what China thinks it's uh, doing with the <clears throat> with the United States, and it sees itself as already at war uh, with, Ch- with, with us, uh, and not just a Cold War. So this fretting about whether we're in a Cold War with China, you just ask the Chinese and they'll put you straight uh, rather quickly. Uh, and I would note with uh, PNG that it is actually a very big island, and it is strategically located uh, right to the north of Australia <clears throat> and right in the very close to the heart of America's and the free world's central Pacific defenses. Uh, so this is strategic geography if there ever was one. Uh, and it's a good opportunity that has come our way. It didn't come out of the blue, but some people worked on it and made it happen. Now let's see what they actually do with it. Very interesting strategy there. Grant Newsham, retired Marine Colonel, thank you so much for your analysis. Pleasure to be here. Russia's prime minister signed a set of agreements with China on Wednesday during a trip to Beijing. He described bilateral ties between the two countries at an unprecedented high. They are characterized by mutual respect of each other's interests, the desire to jointly respond to challenges. 
Ms. Houston held talks with Chinese Premier Li Qiang and was due to meet with Chinese leader Xi Jinping. He is the highest-ranking Russian official to visit Beijing since Moscow sent thousands of its troops to Ukraine in February 2022. With the war in Ukraine in its second year, Russia increasingly feels the weight of Western sanctions. Moscow is leaning on Beijing for support. The agreements signed include the export of agricultural products to China and joint investment in trade services. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, don't hesitate to email us at news.today at ntd.com. And still to come, is the noise from heat pumps harmful? As the alternative for gas heating grows in popularity, we explore the pros and cons. Over 70,000 residents in southern Spain are relying on daily water deliveries after a reservoir dried up. We'll have more for you shortly here on NTD News Today. Henry Repeating Arms manufactures a line of classic American-made rifles and shotguns. With over 200 models to choose from and a wide variety of finishes and calibers, there's a Henry that's right for you. Every purchase is backed by our lifetime warranty and award-winning customer service. We invite you to order a copy of our free catalog and decals. Simply call the number on your screen or visit HenryUSA.com. That's HenryUSA.com. The Fixture Pioneer, CGM. Professional AI intelligent fixtures. All-round integration of four systems. High precision, high durability, high quality. Two micrometer repetition accuracy. More than 80 patent certificates. ISO 9001 approved. Precision clamping to meet your every need. CGM has it all. Pride of Taiwan, CGM. Tired of scrolling Netflix? Trying to find something that's worth watching? Want to skip the censorship in mainstream media? Well, now you can with Epic TV. New exclusive content every day with over 100 never-before-seen movies, films, and documentaries. Available and streaming now at your fingertips. For a limited time now, you can get 60% off Epic TV by subscribing or upgrading to a yearly plan. Plus, get an additional $10 credit to rent featured movies on Epic Cinema today. Skip mainstream narratives and find quality family entertainment from the comfort of your very own home. Say no to big tech and subscribe to Epic TV. Thank you. Great to have you back with us. Our coverage continues overseas. Schools in the UK are trying to cut down on the number of underage students using vapes. From detection units and toilets to airport-style wands, measures are being put in place to try to deter e-cigarette use. According to the UK's National Health Service, around 1 in 10 children between the ages of 11 and 15 vape. A school in London is tackling the growing trend. This airport-style wand to detect vapes is just one of the measures to address vaping by students. We're seeing them more and more leaving the classroom to go to the toilet and they're wanting to go to vape because they can't go an hour or two without having a puff of smoke. 
The school has installed vape detectors in toilets. Teachers are being alerted when an alarm goes off. Many children are being tempted by vape promotion on social media. But teachers have struggled to get their videos published by students taken down, despite being able to prove they are underage. From our experiences at the school, um, dealing with TikTok, for example, it's very difficult to get videos down. A parent says his son started vaping at age 14 and became addicted. Yeah, my son was a, was a fairly active teenager. He played football for the school, played football for another team, generally like walking. And beginning of the year, we went up four flights of stairs and he was out of breath halfway up. Students at a school in England are using VR headsets to enter the metaverse for more interactive lessons. From science to history, art, and geography, the metaverse allows them to dive deeper into the subjects they're studying. Would you send your kids to this metaverse school, where pupils don't just learn about planets, they play with them? Okay, that Saturn is way too big. And they don't just read about hearts, they enter them. And you can see the flow of blood through it, and you can understand the chambers and the valves. It's literally walk through a heart. Redham House School okay. in England ah. is trialling teaching children in the metaverse, using VR headsets to dive deeper into the subjects they're studying. We've used virtual reality across every subject as part of our pilot for virtual reality. Some of the most impressive things we can do are science experiments that would otherwise be impossible or too dangerous to do in a classroom. Saskia and Alex are Metaverse students and have been taking part in subjects from science to history, art and geography. It was really cool how I got to kind of put the heart in a different place because if, if you were in a normal classroom, you can't do that. Because in a normal classroom, if I went up to a human heart, I wouldn't go anywhere near it. Yeah, no, but know. in the Metaverse, in the classrooms, it's like you're not holding anything, but you actually are. Because the digital version of Redham House School is a virtual location, the lessons are accessible for students anywhere in the world. The Metaverse School is being developed by Inspired Education Group. Nathan O'Grady is project lead. But we can also use it in subjects like geography to have an instantaneous field trip anywhere in the world. We've used it in history to go back in time, experience things like World War II from the ground and understand what those atmospheres were like. We were doing a space topic and that was perfect. So we learned about the solar system planets, what's a star, what's a satellite. That's a good setting. The retention is fantastic. Once they've seen something, they'll remember it. And um, there's a deeper understanding because they can manipulate an object. They can see it from all sides. They can see how it works. They can see the function. And so they really get a deeper, better understanding. Across the U.S., over 15 states and hundreds of cities are taking steps to encourage the installation of heat pumps. They are promoted as an alternative to air conditioners and gas boilers in order to meet climate goals. But in the United Kingdom, there are worries about the harm from the noise they emit. Entity's Malcolm Hudson has more. The British government is reviewing whether the widespread adoption of electric heat pumps may result in too much noise in residential areas. Heat pumps are part of the UK government's net zero carbon emissions strategy. The government has a target of installing 600,000 heat pumps per year by 2028. They run on electricity and work like a fridge in reverse, by extracting heat from the air or ground and transferring it into a building, while a gas boiler burns gas to heat a home. Individually, heat pumps make about as much noise as a fridge or an air conditioner. But John Stewart, chair of the UK Noise Association, said the problem lies in the collective noise from many heat pumps in one neighbourhood. The real problem and the real untested problem is if you're living in a block of flats and everybody's got a heat pump, or if you're living in a row of terraced houses and each house has got a heat pump in its back garden. Noise pollution is a growing public health concern. It's linked to hearing loss, but also to sleep disturbances, stress, mental health issues and even heart problems. A single heat pump emits a constant hum between 40 and 60 decibels. And it's uncertain what impact it will have on people with hearing problems. We really do think that the impact of heat pumps, the cumulative impact has to be looked at, the impact on people with hearing aids, 
people who have got hearing problems generally uh, has, have got to really be assessed quite carefully. Stewart added that if the technology is left untested, many people could spend lots of money and end up living with unacceptable levels of noise. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News, London. All right. Record-breaking April temperatures coupled with a lack of rainfall have resulted in empty reservoirs in southern Spain. Over 70,000 residents are now dependent on daily deliveries of drinking water. Spain is experiencing one of the worst droughts in a decade. This reservoir in the southern province is almost bone dry. It's the source of water for more than 70,000 people. The water smells very bad. It comes out green or yellow, and we can't drink it. We can use it for washing, cleaning, but for drinking and cooking, we can't use it, and so we have to take water from the truck. In the past month, residents of a nearby village had to rely on deliveries of drinking water from a water tanker. Efforts were made to transfer water from another reservoir, but the water was found to be not suitable for drinking. Even if the water comes out clear, you can't drink it. That's the only bad thing about it. You can't drink it and you can't cook with it. The truck bringing drinking water was the final option. In another town, the Civil Protection Corps helped elderly and disabled residents to fill their water bottles. Spain recorded its hottest and driest April ever last month, and nearly 30% of the country is now in a drought emergency. The mayor of the town said they are working with other local authorities to provide water to residents in the two affected regions. Already last summer, we foresaw that the Sierra Boyera reservoir was critical. And if we had a winter like the one we have experienced, with no rain, then logically we have had a major water supply problem. The same regions were affected by the Great Drought 28 years ago. But the mayor's office said at that time the reservoir didn't go completely dry. A cultural note coming up for you next. Ukrainian potters are keeping their traditional ceramics craft alive despite the challenges caused by the war with Russia. Giant sand sculptures amaze visitors at a Danish festival. We'll see the highlights and hear from the artists when we return. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Welcome back. Ukrainian potters are still creating traditional ceramics despite the challenges caused by the war with Russia. Using ancient techniques, a part of Ukrainian history is kept alive. Let's take a look. Powered by electricity, the wheel is the only modernized tool in this Ukrainian potter's workshop. He tries to keep us close to the techniques his grandfather used before him to preserve the historic craft. The potter is from the town of Kosiv in western Ukraine, which is famous for its painted ceramics. He said there are many elements, motifs and images in Kosiv ceramics. Each master brings something of his own. These range from simple ornamental geometric motifs, plants, flower vases, and all kinds of birds or animals. In 2019, Kosiv ceramics were inscribed on UNESCO's representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. The ceramics, painted in distinguishing green and yellow colors, are made from the local grey clay. The potter has 15 years experience in pottery and has been familiar with the technique of Kosiv ceramics since he was young. He said since war broke out in Ukraine in 2022, pottery making has been challenging. At the time when the electricity was turned off, it was difficult because it was necessary not to interrupt the firing process. There was a lot of failure. The potter doesn't limit himself to traditional Kosiv products. He also makes his own art. Exploring the theme of military, he made a plate called Invasion in 2018, after the Russian annexation of Crimea. 
It symbolizes the invasion of something man-made, hostile to the traditional and harmonious world. It shows a struggle as such. In Lviv, a city in western Ukraine, a man has a collection of tiles made by a distinguished ceramist who created stoves for an Austrian emperor. From jars to mugs, plates and candlesticks, some items are almost 200 years old. He said some tiles have some philosophical and sacred meaning. The plumber does not just work, but works under the all-seeing eye of the Lord and the luminaries of heaven, the sun and the moon. This is both a pottery and a kind of icon. The collector said he has been collecting Kosiv tiles for 40 years. During Soviet times, he had to hide such collections. A sand sculpture festival in Denmark is underway with countless fairy tale inspired works dotting the beach. More than 70,000 visitors are expected over the next six months. Entity's Andrew Thomas has the details. The Princess and the Frog. The Brothers Grimm fairy tale has entertained children worldwide for more than 200 years. Now it's inspired artists at the Hundested Sand Sculpture Festival. But that's just one of more than 20 giant sculptures. The festival started in 2012 as a way to attract tourists to the Danish seaside town. We found out that sand sculpture uh, would be a good thing. A lot of people are coming here to see them. So the first year we had uh, 42,000 uh, people coming in a, to this small town with 8,000 people living. This year's theme is Once Upon a Time. Many of the sculptures are inspired by popular fairy tales. Others are based on more obscure folklore. I mean, we have some very special writers, uh, people that I actually actually didn't know that made, had made on fairy tales. We have fairy, we have stories from Greenland. We have stories from Japan. The festival attracts top international sand sculptors. Many are from Belgium, the Netherlands, Italy, Russia, and the United States. Sand sculptor Sue McGrew from Seattle has spent 10 days working on this Greenlandic-inspired sculpture. She's been making sand sculptures since she was 18 years old. There's something magical about sand sculpting, mostly because people have, most people have played on the beach before. We know what sand is, so we have this natural attraction to it almost. And so to be able to make these amazing monumental sculptures out of something as simple as sand is just amazing. Joris Kivitz has been making sand sculptures for 15 years. The Dutchman says he often builds works that are funny, political, or make people walk away with a question. Writers, they write a book and they can, uh, they can explain whatever they, uh, what they want to say. Uh, for us, that's in sand, or we make sculptures to, to tell people whatever we want. The Hundested Sand Sculpture Festival opens in May and will run until October. Andrew Thomas. NTD News. Coming up, a London zoo welcomes the birth of two rare foals. They're the offspring of one of the world's last wild horse breeds. We'll be back with more for you soon, right here on NTD News. Stay tuned to get two rolls of Alien Tape free. You wouldn't stick your mother-in-law on the wall, but you could. With Alien Tape, it just sticks. Just peel and stick to make anything stay in place quick. Brick, pavers, marble, tile, plastic, even leather. Nothing works better than Alien Tape. You wouldn't stick your fishbowl on a moving car, but you could with Alien Tape. The secret is nano stick technology that grabs and locks on to secure one side of the surface to the other. Alien Tape secures in seconds, then twist, pull, and rinse to reuse. Call or go online to get your first roll of Alien Tape for just $19.99, plus shipping and processing. But to make this deal really stick, we'll give you two more rolls absolutely free. You get three rolls of Alien Tape for one low price. Order now. To order, call 1-800-490-1364 or go to TryAlienTape.com. So call 1-800-490-1364 or order online at TryAlienTape.com. You're still looking good. I'm still feeling good. You know, I've got all your MyPillow products. Mattress topper, bed sheets, MyPillows, towels, slippers, blankets, sleepwear, dog Whoa, bed. whoa, Charles. Everyone now can get MyPillow products at huge discounts at MyPillow.com. 
That's right. Now's the time to go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code to take advantage of our three-in-one sale. We're bringing you exciting new products, overstock specials, and closeout deals you won't find anywhere else. For example, when you buy one of our brand new MyPillow 2.0s, you get another one absolutely free. And with our overstock sale, you save 50% on our luxurious Giza Dream bed sheets. That's as low as $29.99 for the best sheets ever. And with our biggest closeout special, you get our all-season slippers for only $35 or our sandals and slides for just $25. Quantities are limited and once they're gone, they're gone. There's always a searching process for beauty. You know it when you see it. Welcome back. Story for all of you and our animal lovers out there. One of the world's last wild horse species is back from the edge of extinction. A zoo in North London is celebrating the birth of two foals. On the meadows at Whipsnade Zoo, just north of London, two foals are grazing alongside their mother. Keeper Rachel Melvin has been caring for the foals since they were born. One afternoon just behind us over here, we had Charlotte, the first who gave birth to Lorgin, um, gave birth in the middle of the afternoon in front of the public. It was really nice, she did amazing. She's an ex experienced mother. And then about two weeks later, we came in one morning to find that we had a second foal. Really, really exciting, especially because she's a girl. The foals belong to the world's last wild horse species and are part of a successful breeding program. Shavalsky's horses share common ancestry with modern horses but the two lines split over 30,000 years ago. The species was classified as extinct in the wild before they were reintroduced to Mongolia. That was part of a conservation project between scientists from Mongolia and the Zoological Society of London. Chevalsky's horses, named after a Polish explorer, are also known as Mongolian wild horses, or takis, in Mongolia. That reintroduction itself was not possible without zoo uh, captive breeding tahi. So that's why when, when you have like new generation of tahis uh, born in zoos, that's very big excitement, of course. Horses remain an important symbol of Mongolian national identity due to the country's nomadic history and the conquests of Genghis Khan. When horse coming and galloping, coming to you, <laughs> it's in our blood, that, that nomadic culture. And then it just comes like through your uh, throat. Hundreds of wild Shavalsky's horses now live in the Mongolian steppe, and their numbers are growing, reaching 940 at the last count. Five critically endangered Scottish wildcat kittens have been settling in at a wildlife park since their birth in early April. The first litter to their parents, the kittens will soon receive their first health checks when vets will be able to determine their sex. Wildcats are one of Scotland's most iconic animals, but also one of the most endangered. The species is on the brink of extinction due to historic habitat loss, hunting, and interbreeding with domestic cats. Gardeners in New York City are getting some organic help with their summer work from five sheep. The animals will spend the next few months munching on invasive plants. The seasonal staff comes from the Tivoli Lake Reserve and Farm in Albany. This is their third summer at Hammock Grove on Governor's Island. They offer eco-friendly lawn maintenance without the use of chemicals or fossil fuels. Unlike goats, sheep are selective feeders, favoring only invasive species. 
This makes them a great help in landscaping work, and they don't often try to escape. Gardeners say the woolly critters are very effective, except for one problem. They eat too fast. The places where they've grazed a lot, um, the plants we didn't want have gone away, and now we're sort of jumping, trying to figure out how to replace them quick before they, something else comes in that we don't want. Each year, the landscaping team at Governor's Island has increased the size of their pasture. The sheep help free their hands from wet weeding, allowing the time for other gardening projects. And that's all for today's program. I'm Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.